Welcome to Speechless. We're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also playing live over SPNN in St. Paul. And this is a live call-in talk show, so call in with your comments or questions. Uh, if you want to see some past shows, you can go there to youtube.com backslash speechlessmn. Uh, and if you don't want to call in, you can send an email to speechlessmn at gmail.com. Uh, but I'm glad to have you here. A lot of things to go over today. You know, mostly the show is about judicial reform, family law reform, and we're going to discuss a little bit of that um, in some comments that were made on the grazini Rucky case. That's the case where uh, her attorney was thrown in jail for taking a picture and then made in the courtroom and then made to uh, defend her in a wheelchair in handcuffs without her glasses or shoes or her court documents. And that was Michelle McDonald who ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court. And so there's a lot of information going on in that case, a lot of things happening. But when comments get made, I, I kind of know the case pretty well. So I'm going to respond to some of those comments later on in the show. Uh, before we get to that, uh, just a little couple updates here. <coughs> Local issues. North St. Paul uh, appointed a new city council member. I don't remember that city council's member name, but it was the youngest person, and the reason was, well, we need to get young people in here. The, the bottom line, it's about ideology. You had a person there, Bob Zick, who ran for that seat, who has the most experience, most knowledge about government workings. Unfortunately, he has the wrong ideology for them, or the right ideology for the people, and that ideology is a limited government, government is restricted. They shouldn't be out buying community centers and running community centers and running businesses. That's not their purview, city's purview. And that's really not what the, the current members of North St. Paul want. Bob will ask the hard questions to find out what's going on to protect the citizens there. And the current council was not pleased with that. So that's just what's taking place there. Let's get a young guy so we can have him vote the way we want to vote. Uh, and that's expected when you have a majority with a particular ideology of spend money. And uh, who cares about being efficient with it? Uh, of course, these are all my opinions. Uh, and we're going to go with that. <laughs> okay, Maplewood is also having city council elections. And today was the, or um, Monday, I believe, was the deadline, or Tuesday was the deadline for signing up for city council. And um, it doesn't look good for Maplewood except for Diana Longry running. And boy, if you want somebody that knows what's going on, it's going to protect your money and hold Maplewood accountable uh, that they just don't spend money like crazy like they're doing right now and spending it inefficiently and blowing it on a community center. You want to elect somebody. Uh, we are not currently live in St. Paul. Okay, do we know why? Okay. <laughs> anyway, if you want somebody who can ask the hard questions, can get through the bluff, you want Diana Longry on there. Unfortunately, nobody else is running. John Wyckoff put his name in there. He would have been good. He could have second seconded Diana's motions, uh, and Diana could have seconded his, uh, Diana's not going to have anybody there to second her, her motions. Um, and you would think maybe Bob Cardinal, but I don't know that he'd do that. So it will be interesting. Maplewood's got another, at least another two years of uh, bad news and bad spending and, and just bad governance going on. So... Um, Good luck there, but at least get one person on that city council who knows what they're talking about. All right, we got a phone call coming in already. So, uh, caller, you got a comment or question? Tim Kinley. Hey, how, show. how you doing? Good, thank you. And I think what's most disturbing when it comes to the city of North St. Paul, yeah, North St. Paul has got themselves in a culture where they want to do everything in the back room. The back room meeting the little conference room. Right where even if the public goes up there, they're, they're basically 
the conditions are set up so they're feeling uncomfortable. And it's unfortunate when the North St. Paul government operates in that fashion when they do have their regular city council meeting on the cable, but at that meeting, the decisions have already been made. And it's more of just a promotion show saying, isn't North St. Paul a great town? Don't we have a great community event? And could you tell us about the community events this week, uh, Terry Furlong? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you, you have a really good point in, in that aspect is that you had five people interview for the city council slot and uh, four to five, and none of that was on TV. They could have put it on TV. They could have had it live. They have all the equipment. They have all the facilities. They could have gone on Channel 16 and shown it to everybody in North St. Paul, but they didn't do it. Fortunately, a producer uh, for Bob Zick's show went and filmed the whole event. And so you can Excellent. see it, and it will be up on uh, mncd4conservative.com. Uh, and Excellent. So you can see that whole thing, and you're just going to find out there's only one person that knew what they were talking about. Nobody else did, and that was Bob Zick. So, well, I mean, I think we have to thank that uh, Freedom Fighter and the volunteer for going there and doing that because while all these top government officials uh, want to operate secret and keep the public out of it while making a big uh, a paycheck, the one it sounds like that are really involved in getting the community involved in exposing what's going on are the volunteers. That's a tragic situation. Uh, right. Uh, absolutely. And it like it's really highlighted in North St. Paul principally. Right. So you don't get the, the whistleblowers. Uh, <laughs> the government people aren't doing the whistleblowing because they got too much, uh, they got their jobs to be concerned about. I want to make a correction here. Go to youtube.com backslash mncd4conservative. That's where you're going to find the videos on the North St. Paul uh, questioning of potential council members. So... <laughs> Just and, and one other point. Yeah. It, it sounds like it's, uh, thank you for uh, uh, having that on YouTube. Uh, I think that if the city of North St. Paul, the city council there has any interest in having people knowing what's going on, they would put a link to that on their website so that uh, residents and others could have uh, North St. Paul could see that. And now that the taping has been done for free, and it's been put on the Internet for free, uh, North St. Paul going, you know, not uh, publicizing it, not putting a link there, just shows you how stuck in the mud they are and how uh, unwilling and intentionally they want to evade uh, the, their own public uh, eyes of what's going on up at the hall. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, caller. I'll actually go one step further and say they should actually pay the guy for uh, putting it up there, you know, because it's something they should have done. <laughs> um, uh, oh but, no, that's absolutely right. Yeah, and so I mean that's they, absolutely important. They could actually pay double what they normally paid somebody yeah. because they showed their own entrepreneurship and their their own initiative to do it. Well, they have that's a chance. Probably the most important thing they do as the city council. Yeah, they have a chance to redeem themselves. That's for sure. So Thanks. yeah, and there's a lot more going on in North St. Paul. I think if you watch Bob Zick's show this next week. Uh, which is Wednesday night at 8.30. Um, and he may have talked about it last night, but North St. Paul police have 12, my understanding is 12 uh, police officers, and they got 18 superior officers. It just seems a little out of whack there, that number, and two, uh, a police chief, an assistant police chief just doesn't need to be that many people for the size of North St. Paul. There should be more police officers and less superiors. But uh, I think Bob's going to uh, talk about that next week uh, on his show. Interesting. Excellent. I will turn into Bob Zick next week then. Thanks for when the Wednesday at 8.30. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, we are now live in St. Paul. We had so There were some technical difficulties with the link, so... We're glad to have you here, and uh, what you missed out is a conversation about North St. Paul. So if you want to watch that, you're going to have to wait till Saturday and go online at YouTube backsla uh, youtube.com backslash 
speechless MN and, and, and look at it there. Uh, okay. Uh, boy, uh, <laughs> I went to an event yesterday that was put on by StandUpForTruth.org, uh, Libertarian Party Minnesota CD5 affiliate, uh, Blue Republicans, Libertarian Party of Minnesota, Agora Fest 2015, which I think has something to do with uh, pot smoking, uh, and Minnesota Tea Party Alliance, and I was filming for a friend, but this was really an interesting event because, you know, we, we know all about Snowden, uh, who disclosed that the government was, without a warrant, collecting data on citizens of the United States without a warrant, which is totally unconstitutional. And William Biney was in town, or Benny, William Benny was in town. He was a former high-level National Security Agency intelligence official who retired in 2001 after 30 years of service. And when Biney blew the whistle on NSA surveillance, the administration made him the subject of FBI investigation, including a raid on his home in 2007. And I don't have video now, not time, there wasn't time to process it, but it was very, very fascinating. And in light of what Rand Paul did in the Minnesota, in the U.S. Senate, um, and trying to get changes to the Patriot Act, and trying to protect our liberties as best he could, you know, he got away and made some positive changes, but the bottom line is the government can't collect data on you without a warrant. They cannot do it, yet they're doing it. And this is just uh, bizarre. And the government's going, oh, we're not, we're not taking, we're just collecting uh, points of interest, points of data. We're not, we're not going out and uh, we don't know who it is. You know, but we're just storing this information, and then if we need it later, we can go back and figure out who it is. But the problem is, that's not what they're doing. That's what they're saying they're doing, but what these whistleblowers are saying, no, that's not what they're doing. They're collecting data, not only to collect it, but to know who you are, who you're associating with, and to find out everybody you're associated with without a warrant. So what, you, what the way our government is to work is you... Get a warrant. If you think there's criminal activity, you get a warrant, and then you start connecting the dots. You don't do it beforehand. And this is just outrageous, and it needs to stop. And so pretty soon, as we're going to find out here, uh, hate speech is going, to, is going to come into play, and then you're going to have the guilt of association by, you know, and, and they're going to define what hate speech is. And so, therefore, you will no longer have freedom of speech. You won't have the right to speak out against your government. You won't have the right to express your opinions on various subject matters, religious or non-religious. And the government will come after you, and they will use these, th these records and then get other people because you associate with them. So... Very, very interesting meeting. Another person that was there who I, I don't agree with very much is Todd Pierce. I, I liked what this uh, Benny had to say, but Todd Pierce, who's an attorney and a retired U.S. Army Judge Advocate General Corp. Officer, he served as a military defense counsel before the military commissions on teams representing three Gu Gu Guantanamo clients. And I appreciate it, you know, that he defended them. Be and I think that's great to have a defense. Everybody should be able to have a, someone defend them uh, because a lot of games and scams can go on by accusers. So I'm all for that. One thing he said, though, <laughs> that just really bothered me, is that there's really this no such thing as a caliphate. Uh, and that, that's just a bunch of baloney. I mean, that's just a total lack of understanding of the Muslim faith to say there's no caliphate. And I'm going to have to bring the video in now, and at least when he's talking, and where you can hear these Muslim men getting together and say, hey, the, that, uh, you know, the, the word is used that they, these are radical Muslims. 
you know, and they're, and, these, and they're doing radical things. And the Muslims are saying, hey, we're not radical. This is normal. <laughs> okay? What we call radical, they're calling normal. This is the way we are. Okay? So it's not radical Muslim at all. It's normal Muslims to go out and behead people. And I'm going to bring that into, well, you know what? We're going to get on to this religious persecution issue here uh, and, and what's happening. And a federal judge just ruled recently that a student was wrongly punished for preaching at his school. And this student uh, in high school would hand out um, flyers, would hand out flyers to advance, would hand out Bibles, uh, Bible verses, would, would do a number of things, would express his views. Uh, but during, before, before and after, and during lunchtime in school. And, and he would talk to kids that wanted to talk to him. And so somebody filed a complaint, and he, he ended up, the school ended up kicking him out of school and disciplining him. So the kid filed a lawsuit in federal court. He ended up winning the case and the attorneys got paid uh, some money, and, and he gets a dollar in, in d token damages. So probably what happened, the guy didn't want to go. He should have gone after him. You know, these, these school districts need to learn their lessons when they violate somebody's free speech rights. And you as a student don't lose free speech rights because you're in a school. And you get to express, that's, why, that's how you're able to learn by asking questions, by making statements, by having dialogue, by having debate, that's what school's about. But in our, in our schools, they're not doing that. Basically, right now, they're pushing the, the gay uh, GLBTQ agenda, and, and if you speak out against it, we're going to punish you. Uh, and so, you know, I... You always need a defense, so I question this guy on his beliefs that there's no such thing as a Muslim caliphate going on, and we're still going to continue into that, because this, is, this happened to a high school kid. At least there was a federal judge there that said, no, this is wrong. But the other issue with that is uh, it still had to go to federal court, and it can still be appealed. I doubt it will be appealed. It's really going to be a hard one to overturn, even in the Ninth Circuit. I don't think they would approve uh, of this, uh, um, of the, what the school has, had done. It's so blatant. But what else is happening, and here's part of it, you know, not only public schools, but in, out in society, an Oregon couple in the business arena uh, who had a, have their religious faith and want to practice it, denied a cake for a same-sex wedding, where these couple had bought cakes and stuff but from before, but this couple asked them to participate in their wedding, and they said no, and they were given names of other places that would bake a cake for them. So they, it's, and they did get a cake from someplace else, so it wasn't like they're without a cake uh, or anything. Uh, but what happened in the process of their prosecution, you, in these type of things, you go before an administrative law judge. It's, a, it's an appointed judge, and um, um, in, in the, it's a Bureau of Labor and Industries for Oregon. And Alan uh, McCollum uh, issued a proposed order that said that the Kleins, this couple, pay $135,000 in fines. Uh, but now, uh, on appeal, it goes to Brad Avakian, who is an elected official. Who, he's going to issue the final order on this, and he may raise it, he may lower it, or keep it the same. But either way, what they found out in this case that both these people, and especially Brad Avakian, was involved in the, and already made the decision before there was ever any, ever any hearing. Okay, so there was, co co and also collusion between an Oregon GLBTQ organization um, and, and the labor board. There was already 
organization uh, and communication going on in the trying of this case. And so they were trying to get this case brought to the civil courts. Uh, and Brad Avakian was part of that. And so they're asking him to be recused and, uh, from the case, Brad Avakian, who's going to make the final decision. Uh, so it's, you know, you don't have freedom of association. You do. It's part of our life. Uh, but it's trying to be taken away. Uh, and the only way to, to prevent it from taking, being taken away is to fight back and, and win these cases while you can. And so you set that precedent because that precedent will be overturned. It will be harder to overturn, but yet liberals have no problem overturning prior uh, court cases. And so from, from that case and, and the collusion going on there, I just have some comments about uh, Nancy Pelosi, former Speaker of the House, who made some comments, who's a Catholic, who made some comments about Senator Mark Rubio on, on what it means to be a good Catholic, <laughs> you know. And uh, Nancy Pelosi was saying that Mark, uh, Marco Rubio's position in opposition to same-sex marriage was not um, was not not according to mainstream Catholicism, and that he was out of uh, it wasn't part of of Nancy Pelosi's growing up in a mainstream Catholic family. Of course, there's uh, probably what you would call an uh, Orthodox Catholic family. But, you know, I guarantee you back then when Nancy Pelosi grew up in a mainstream Catholic family, uh, which there's nothing mainstream about Nancy Pelosi that I, under that I know of, is that they wouldn't even, they probably never even talked about same sex marriage or gay marriage because back then, there just wasn't any discussion about it. So she's going after um, Marco Rubio, but Nancy Pelosi's got a bigger, pro bigger problem. It's just she's going against Catholic teaching, you know. So she's the one that should be kicked out of the Catholic Church for her position on abortion and then a p position on same-sex marriage. Catholic Church doesn't support same-sex marriage. It's just, you know, but here's, here's what's going on. What's going on is just, we're going to say it. You know, Nancy Pelosi is just going to say what she wants to say, and the intent is to deceive the ignorant and the people that want to hear something else, that want to have their ears tickled. And that's exactly what's going on here. In the meantime, the religious freedom gets shut down, which is the whole intent of the GLBTQ um, uh, ideology is to make themselves to be mainstream and then go after anybody who objects to them, and which is totally opposite of what Christianity does. Okay, and you see that really clear in the Christian versus Muslim issue where Christians lay down their life. Jesus laid down his life. He died for our sins versus Muhammad who would be had if you didn't convert. And where Christians lay down their lives when uh, people come after them, when the Muslims come after them to kill them if they don't convert. Where Christians don't kill Muslims if they don't convert, they try to talk to them. Okay, and they don't go out and try to behead him. The only time Christians engage Muslims is when they group together and say, no Muslims, you stop your behavior. That's not acceptable behavior to go out and behead somebody because you dis disagree with them. Okay, and of course the Muslims will twist that around. Well, you're coming after us, you know, you're stopping us from doing our religion, which is beheading people who don't 
uh, acknowledge Muhammad as the great prophet. So in, in light of that, uh, uh, an interesting dynamic is taking place, and I'm going to go to one more example in the um, Islamist, Islamic world and the Muslim faith, is that in Sudan uh, we have heard already about uh, Miriam Ibrahim, who was put on death row for her faith, a former Muslim that came to know Christ, gave her life to Christ. So she was put on death row for believing in Jesus Christ as her Savior and Jesus as God uh, versus believing in Muhammad uh, the prophet. And so they put her on death row. Uh, and because of all the political pressure, which the governmental process pressure that was put on Sudan, they released her and let her go. And they turn around now and are uh, in the process right now of having a number of days of trial for two pastors, again in the Sudan. Um, Pastor Ruat, R-U-O-T, and Reith, R-E-I-T-H. And they face numerous trumped-up charges. Um, so the judges extended the trial until June 15th to allow Sudan's Islamist nation, National Intelligence and Security Service more time to produce evidence against them. Okay, so they're just starting this all over again with somebody else. And, and you know, that's part of the plan. They'll keep on doing this. Um, but... Because people spoke up, and the people of the United States spoke up, one person's life, Miriam's life, was spared. Will these pastors' lives be spared? Because the, death, the, the penalty is the death penalty in this situation. So, But there's an interesting paradigm going on here that I think is right and natural, um, and especially it happens in kids. Uh, with kids, uh, they don't necessarily have a solid foundation for what they believe, and they're taking inform in information. What's happening in the Muslim community, according to break Breaking Christian News, is that many Muslims are leaving, kids are leaving the Muslim faith. And there's a reason they're leaving the Muslim faith, is they're saying, if ISIS is Islam, then I'm out of here. I'm leaving. And by ISIS being Islam, what they're saying is, I don't like beheading people. I don't like that idea. Um, and I don't see this religion of peace really being a religion of peace. They see, they see it as being a religion of murder. And so what these kids are doing, they're either turning to atheism which I think is a, is a logical conclusion uh, in this because you got to deal with suffering. You have to have a right understanding of suffering. Or, and or, the re not and or, but the other thing that's happening is they're turning to Jesus Christ. Because of media <laughs> and the internet access and social media and stuff like that, they're able to hear and understand a different message uh, than they've been told about Christianity. And I know a number of Muslims, and I've met a number of Muslims who have come out of the Muslim faith who were saying they were raised in hatred and their whole life was hatred. And then finally, because a set of circumstances came into play where they're able to talk to uh, a Christian or they read some material, they begin to understand that the real religion of peace was Christianity and laying down your life. Uh, a, a, just a different mindset. And so uh, in the Muslim community, um, it's facing a crisis right now. And I, <laughs> actually, I think it's a good thing. Uh, and a lot of these Muslim kids are keeping quiet about their conversion because 
they'll be disowned by their family and they will also have the chance of being killed by their parents. That's what they called honor killings um, that take place in the Muslim community. And it's just a, it's a different ball game. And I've showed the video of the past from David Crowder, a comedian, but a uh, very poignant way that the Muslim uh, Christ versus Muhammad, you know, how Christ treated women versus how Muhammad, you know, told the adulterers, go and sin no more. Uh, Muhammad said, stoner, you know, stone the adulteress and uh, make these women slaves. You know, just a different, different ball game altogether. Uh, so anyway, interesting stuff, in my opinion, of what's taking place. And um, I, and I'm going to tie that back into the the Clinton presidency. I, I, <laughs> wait till you hear this, and th and this is just amazing to me because the our enemies, people that have sworn their hatred to the United States, and they want to destroy the United States have given a lot of money to the Clinton Foundation. Yet, what I'm going to lay out for you is a very understandable way so that you could understand how it took place. And you can see how this money laundering took place so that the Clinton Foundation got money. Instead of these people just giving money straight to various countries and organizations, here's what they did to get the money to them. And it's I, I think you'll find this fascinating, and what it is, it's a textbook case on how to hide foreign money. And this is the Clinton scam and, and how it works, and this was sent to me uh, by a friend, and I, I understand this. Okay, so this is textbook, and it's all tax-free. Here's how it works. Okay, first of all, what you need to do is you need to create a separate foreign charity. In this case, the charity is in Canada. And that's what took place. A charity was formed in, Can in Canada. And then what you have is you have a bunch of foreign oligarchs and governments, many sworn enemies of the United States. They donate to this Canadian charity. In this case, over a thousand people did and they contributed millions of dollars uh, and at, at somewhere around 27 million. I, I don't know the exact number, but there's millions of dollars connected to this charity. Now, understand this. They did it out of the goodness of their heart. I mean, people that give to charity give to, out of the goodness of their heart. And you got to believe that. And you also have to believe that they expect nothing in return from that donation. Okay. These are foreign countries given to a Canadian country, many of them Muslim uh, countries. Might even be a Russian company, a country in there. Hmm. Why would Putin give money to a Canadian charity? Okay, what the Canadian charity then does is bundle these separate donations, they put all these donations together and then makes a massive donation to the Clinton Foundation. Okay, so you're understanding how this is happening? Make a charity in Canada, give a bunch of donations from foreign people, foreign governments into Canada. That charity in Canada then makes a donation to the Clinton Foundation. The Clinton Foundation and the cooperating Canadian charity claim Canadian laws prohibits the identification of individual donors. But is that true? And my understanding that that's not true. That in Canada, you have to say who the donors are. Okay? So, but understand, that's, you know, oh, that's what we thought it was. That's what we believed it to be. We, we didn't have to tell. Okay? But so, what happens then, the next step is the Clinton Foundation then spends some of this money for legitimate good works programs. Unfortunately, experts believe this is on the order of 10%. Much of the balance goes to enrich the Clintons, pay the salaries to untold numbers of hangers-on, and fund lavish travel. 
again, virtually all, all of this is, virtually all of it is tax-free because it's running through foundations and charities, which means because it's being tax-free, you and I are subsidizing it. Well, you know what? I mean, I, I think that's a stretch, okay? You know, if you if you're given through religious groups and stuff like that, you have freedom of religion. You're not subsidizing anything. The only thing you're subsidizing is that charity. And actually, we should have charitable donations be tax deductible again, the full amount. That's, I mean, otherwise, we don't have freedom of religion. You can't practice your faith. And I'm really surprised there haven't been uh, churches or church agencies that have challenged that in the tax law. Um, so then, anyway, I, I'm not going to say that we're subsidize. We end up subsidizing uh, the charity, or the government gets less money because they're not paying paying all their taxes. But either way, um, not this money is being paid to for a lavish lifestyle. Okay, so this, the next thing that happens is the Clinton Foundation with access to the world's best accountants that got to know this stuff inside and out somehow fails to report much of this on their tax filings. They discover these clerical errors and begin to process the process of refiling five years of tax returns. Five years. Refile five years. I mean, that's, that's a huge mistake. Fortunately, you know, our government, they, they let you correct things, you know, but these, these guys should know better. Okay, but since they're doing this scam, you know, trying to run this thing, they may not wanted people to know. And so that may have been intentional. It, it may not have. Of course, that's going to have to be the result of any prosecutors determine whether that was our jury is to say, yeah, this was intentional or not. Um, and they also filed these returns after there was a great amount of exposure to what was going on uh, with the foundation and with the taxes and who was giving the money and for where this money was going. So <clears throat> the net result, foreign money, much of it from enemies of the United States, goes into the Clinton's pockets tax-free and untraceable back to the original donor. Okay, And this is, in my opinion, the, uh, a great definition of money laundering. Uh, so the, the linkage between these foreign donations and favors done by the Clintons, including Hillary as a Secretary of State, um, there's, there needs to be more research on that, and there's trying to be more research on that. And if they can, I mean, we understand some of the basics of it, and, and at least some of the transactions, but it will just really blow away this money laundry uh, and, and, and uh, converting it to bribing and treason. So... One interesting link that's been found out is this Canadian charity includes uh, a principal whose name is Frank Gistra, G-I-U-S-T-R-A. And if you check him out on the net, internet, he is a guy who was central to the formation of Uranium One, the Canadian company that somehow acquired massive U.S. uranium interests and then sold them to an organization controlled by Russia and Putin. This transaction required the U.S. State Department approval, and guess who was Secretary of State when this approval was granted? Now, there's no, nothing to see here, of course. Okay, and much of this uranium is going to be sold to Iran. And, of course, it's going to be for peaceful purposes. Okay, I, I just want to bring this in contrast to a Virginia governor, Bob McDonald, who was, um, is in jail because he and his wife took 165000 in gifts and loans for doing minor favors for a guy promoting a vitamin company. It wasn't legal, but it not exactly putting the U.S. security at risk. This is a huge, huge issue. And... I, I think, and I still th 
believe that if you just say Benghazi, that's enough for Hillary Clinton not to be elected. That was bad enough. This is far, far worse because it sure looks like she was taking kickbacks and bribes uh, in, in order to make sure certain policies took place, like the transfer of the selling of the uranium company, uh, when it shouldn't have taken place at all. That, that's a huge problem. All right, and speaking of another socialist, um, Bernie Sanders was in town, and so we're going to play a couple clips of what Bernie Sanders had to say, and I'll make some comments on the other side. So let's hear Bernie uh, talk about his socialist ideology here. And when we talk about the economy, when we talk about the economy, let's also be clear that millions of American workers are working in wages which are much, much too low. It is indefensible, it is unacceptable that women doing the same work as men make 78 cents on the dollar. That's got to change. All right, I got a really couple strong statements here. Here, um, First of all, <clears throat> Bernie Sanders, wages are too low. Well, you can't force wages up um, artificially because when you do, you're going to lose jobs. And all these cities that have gone to this $15 an hour minimum wage, these em employees who get their wages are then finding out they're losing their jobs and a number of these businesses are going out of business. They can't afford to do it. But you got to ask yourself another question, why can't they afford to do it? Why are wages low? And the wages are low is because the workforce is great. So we got all this illegal immigration, illegal aliens coming on, putting pressure on our workforce to keep wages lower. Okay? It's not a matter of not having enough workers. We have too many workers. Okay, and we create these artificial um, economic zones and artificial economies by putting certain restrictions or letting certain things take place, uh, like illegal immigration, and it forces wages down. And so to say wages are too low, well, why? Because Bernie Sanders, you're a socialist and you support illegal immigration. That's why. Uh, and then, and then we take those good jobs and you take them out of the country. Okay, so, you know, it, it just doesn't work. Now, another thing he said here was that women only get paid 78 cents on the dollar compared to men. And my challenge to Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton or anybody is show me that woman. I don't think she exists. Show me that woman, you know, and then when you use the statistics that they use in order to create the 78 cents on the dollar for a man, you look at how they de de define that and you can be paying women the same wages as a man and by the way they do the statistics, she'd be earning less even though she's earning the same. And the reason they do that is they count women who aren't working. And they count women who aren't make, working as many hours. And they count women who are in pregnancy leave or whatever reason. But it's not a fair calculation. And if you want a good book on that, go read Why Men Earn More by uh, w uh, William Farrell. It, it's a great book. And it tells you all the ways that women earn more money. Okay, of course, the title was Why Men Earn More, but it shows you the professions where women earn more money and why they earn more money in those professions. It also shows you why men earn more, and it has nothing to do with not being paid the same, because they are being paid the same. 
So there's different factors that come into why wages are lower for women in these calculations. But we want to ignore this. And it's a great line for progressives and the ignorant, but it's a, it's a basic lie. So what you have to do, they're making the scientific claim that women are making less. They're making it as if it's a scientific claim. So the answer, so the question is, well, show me that woman that's making less. And they don't do it. You know, it's just, and, and nobody, I, I hear very few people challenging it in the public, even on Fox News. I don't hear them challenging it like it should be challenged. Betty McCollum, uh, U.S. Representative here in the 4th Congressional District in Minnesota, she uses it on her Facebook and Twitter all the time. But show me that woman. And, and they won't, won't be able to do it. Okay, uh, let's hear the, ne the next clip. Now, when we deal with income and wealth inequality, what we have to understand is not just that the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations are doing phenomenally well. What we also have to understand is that we have a tax system which is written by these very same people and is grossly unfair. So let me be very clear and let me tell all the billionaires who are watching that TV, if I'm elected president, you're going to start paying your fair share. which allows huge and profitable corporations to stash their money in the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, Luxembourg, and other tax havens. And in a given year, some of these large, profitable corporations pay zero in federal income tax, and we are losing well over $100 billion every year because of this tax loophole. Warren Buffett, one of the richest guys in the world, reminds us often that he, a multi-billionaire, pays an effective, i.e. real tax rate, which is lower than his secretaries, lower than truck drivers, and lower than nurses. At a time when the wealthiest people are doing phenomenally well, when we have massive income and wealth inequality, when we have huge unmet social needs, these people will start paying their fair share of Well, if Bernie gets his way, we won't have a country anymore because he's a socialist. And so the country will, you know, won't, won't be here. But he said $100 billion of tax revenue well, wait a second, we have a, a trillion, two trillion dollars of debt we're adding on to the country each year. So it's not a, how much we're bringing in, in revenue, it's what we're spending. And so it, he, he just doesn't make any sense. Of course, the naive will listen like he knows what he's talking about or like they know what he's talking about. Uh, and also, the, the 5% richest people, income earners in the United States, pay 50% of the taxes. And if they paid all their revenue in taxes, they, they wouldn't even be able, to, we would still wouldn't be able to pay off our debt or pay uh, the, the uh, annual debt. So it's, it's not the problem. The tr problem is the spending uh, that's going on and policies like Hastert would put in. Uh, well, we're going to move on from here. And you know what? Corporations would like to spend their money here, but because the tax laws are so draconian, 
poor corporations, uh, they have freedom. They know where to go with it. And so what Bernie really doesn't want is freedom. Okay, we're going to close out here with uh, just an update on the Sandra Grazzini Rocky case. And there was an article came out in the our blog that Michael Broadcourt did that uh, probably accurately reflected that Sandra Grazzini Rocky is behind on her child support by three months and is going to get her license taken away. And... Um, uh, and really made it sound like she's just this bad person that isn't paying her child support. Uh, you have to understand how this process works, and he doesn't lay out what Judge Knutson did in this process. First of all, Judge Knutson takes away everything from her, all any assets, she got nothing, takes away the kids, she got nothing. Uh, while they're having their hearing, she puts her, the Judge Knutson puts her attorney, Michelle McDonald, uh, in handcuffs for taking in a picture in the courtroom uh, during recess or before the court even starts in session and has her attorney do the trial without her notes, her glasses, her shoes, and in handcuffs really, really bizarre. Now there's a federal lawsuit on that. But what David Knutson also did, and this is a trick judges play, is they say to a person who makes certain amount of hours, and if you're an airline stewardess, an airline pilot, you're restricted on how often you can fly. Okay, and then if you have kids, you may have other structures you have to deal with. Okay, but as a pilot, you're restricted. As an airline stewardess, you're restricted to how much you can fly to. So the judge will look at that schedule and say, well, you got a lot more hours you can work. And so you're making X amount of dollars, uh, but you can work more hours, which you can't, and which you're told you can't, and all the witnesses say you can't. But the judge says, yeah, you can, and then doubles the income, and then makes child support payments payments to be made based on double the income. And so instead of paying 35% of your income, you're now paying 70% of your income. But when you only have, uh, of a set, you're, you're paying, yeah, you're paying 70% of your income, but then you're in arrears right away. And, and you're behind the schedule from the get-go. And so th there's another federal law that says the the government can only take 65 of your income if you got judgments against from you. It's a federal law. 65% is the max you can take. And so, but what these companies do is they go, the, the, the or child support says, hey, uh, this person owes X amount of dollars and child support send it in. So the company goes, well, the child support said you got to pay this monthly and here's your check you know, and how much you owe in child support is more than your check, so we send it all in. And you go to that company and say, no, you can only do 65%. So instead, you get nothing. You work your hours, full-time job, you get nothing. How's that going to work? You're going to be behind in your child support. And so the system automatically makes you behind. Then they take away your license, and then they threaten you with jail, and they do, th this is how the scam works. And this is what David Knutson did. And so for Michael Broadcorp to write his article, lay down these facts without giving all the other facts, lays out a distorted picture of what really takes place. And so in the end, it makes criminals out of people that that's the only option they had, is to end up being a criminal. Uh, and it's forced on them. And they did nothing uh, to deserve that status. Uh, so it happens quite often in the federal court system. So we're going to see, or, I mean in the state court system. So <clears throat> the, the other thing that happens is David Knutson has this, he told Grazzini Rucky, I got a warrant out here. It's unsigned. You show up in the courthouse. I'm going to sign it. A warrant for your arrest. For what? 
you know, it's unstated. So he puts out this verbal threat, like he did a verbal warrant, which the NSA people say you can't, you know, you or the whistleblowers, you know, Fourth Amendment, you, if you're doing a warrant, you got to go place, time, manner, uh, what's to be seized and who's to be seized. And it's got to be written out. And, um, of course, David Knutson, according to the sheriffs in his courtroom, are saying he's, he issued oral warrants. And you can't do that. So then David Knutson goes and tells uh, Sandra Grazini Rucky, uh, we got an oral warrant where I'm going to issue once you walk into this courtroom. So what happens is you don't go back to that courtroom because you have a choice of being free. You see the game that gets played here? It's just dirty, dirty pool. When somebody shows up to court, try to defend their rights, and the judge is playing a game, to destroy them, to protect his own reputation. We don't know what's going on. We don't know the bottom of this. But there's something really, really fishy, and that's what the press isn't covering. And if they were to cover that, that would blow the lid off of what's happening in Dakota County. And it's worse than that in Dakota County. So these judges are trying also to re restrict freedom of speech. All right, we're done here. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Sets on fire